Hello and welcome to an episode of The Central Equilibrium. I'm Eric Kai, the chemical statistician, and I'm pleased to welcome my guest, Mitchell Boggs, who will talk about game theory and behavioral ecology. Mitchell, welcome to The Central Equilibrium. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm excited to be here. Tell us about your educational background. Well, I'm an undergraduate student with the University of Guelph going into my fifth year. Uh -huh. uh, my major is conservation biology, uh -huh. and I focus on behavioral ecology, the uh -huh. topic of today, uh -huh. and looking at how behavior and strategies develop in populations. Okay, and tell us about your current occupation. Well, for the next 24 hours, I will be <laughs> an employee of Enveronics Analytics working as a product management uh, assistant, uh -huh. helping with quality assurance and quality control. Okay. Uh, and what is your overall objective for this episode? Um, my objective is to show that through game theory, mm -hmm. we can understand why seemingly disadvantageous behaviors in mm -hmm. populations not only exist, mm -hmm. but can sometimes dominate mm -hmm. within a population. Okay. So, I am not terribly familiar with ecology. Uh, but I did study some economics, and I am familiar with game theory through economics. I had no idea that game theory plays a key role in ecology. So tell us, how does game theory generally fit into ecology? So game theory gave us a framework to better understand why animals behave in the way they do. Okay. Beforehand, we were able to observe behaviors uh -huh. and see their proportion in a population, uh -huh. but we couldn't empirically say why they were there, especially if they seemed disadvantageous or maladapted, uh -huh. meaning they, aren't, they don't seem to be as successful. Uh -huh. So this framework gave us the ability to dig deeper mm -hmm. into the behaviors of a population. Mm -hmm. Now, tell us some of the central figures in the history of ecology that introduced game theory into this field. So, game theory was originally created by, for evolutionary game theory uh -huh. by Ronald Fisher, the famous statistician. Yes, of course. All, I, I am, of course, as a statistician, I'm familiar with Ronald Fisher. Yeah. yeah. All the way back in 1930, <clears throat> he published a paper about looking at the sex ratios in mammals. Uh -huh. He created evolutionary game theory to try and understand why there seemed to be a equality in sex ratio, male to female, uh -huh. in mammal populations. Uh -huh. But evolutionary game theory was kind of left by the wayside for uh -huh. about 40 years. It uh -huh. wasn't until 1973 uh -huh. when John Maynard Smith and George Price picked up the idea of game theory and applied it to behavior. Uh -huh. They realized they could look at a conflict mm -hmm. and take those behaviors used in a conflict mm -hmm. and turn them into strategies and mm -hmm. apply mathematical principles and qualities to these behaviors. Uh -huh. And this would allow them to predict the results of these interactions and uh -huh. figure out which strategy would dominate and would be more beneficial. Okay. And could you take a simple example in animal ecology and illustrate how, how this works? Definitely. Um, I've, my first example will be the work of a man from 1982, I apologize, I just want to make sure I have his name proper, Robert Axelrod. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. In 1982, he took this idea of evolutionary game theory mm -hmm. and applied it to cooperation. Okay. And up until this point, we knew cooperation existed. Mm -hmm. It didn't fit into the idea of evolution uh -huh. because it seemed less fit and less beneficial than always fighting and trying to get as much as you can for yourself. Uh -huh. And it was this paper, this seminal piece, uh -huh. that gave us a better understanding uh -huh. and showed us just how powerful evolutionary game theory can be. Okay, so I remember from my economics courses that uh, game theory is often studied using payoff matrices. Right, precisely. Uh, so, can we do the same thing for animal behavioral ecology? Most definitely. Okay. We, so, so we why don't we do? Why don't we draw some payoff uh, matrices? All right. So, okay. So, what, why don't you uh, draw whatever you need here? Yeah. Or, 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 or perhaps before we do, we, we draw the matrices. Perhaps set up the scenario. Tell us, 
tell us what this conflict is about. All right, so the conflict that we will be looking at uh -huh. will be over a reward. In this case, we'll say this reward is food. Okay. So what happens is a piece of food is on the ground uh -huh. and two individuals encounter, they meet each other at this piece of food. Okay. Let's say we're birds uh -huh. and we have found a piece of meat. Uh -huh. So when bird one, meets bird two, uh -huh. there are two possible behaviors, or two. Yes, bird thank two. you. Bird, yeah. There are two possible behaviors that could occur. Uh -huh. The first we can see is the bird can choose to fight for the reward. So bird one and bird two, they, could, both, cho they, ch they could choose to fight against each other for that piece of meat. Correct. Correct. Uh -huh. Or, the alternative possibility, they could choose to share uh -huh. this food. There we are. So, there so, are... Sorry, I'm just gonna, yep. gonna erase this boundary, just so that we're, we're clear that, that yes. these two options are for bird two, these, these two, two are options for are for bird one. Okay, thank yep. you. <clears throat> so we have four possible outcomes. Yeah. So if we look at when the two birds fight, uh -huh. we'll be focusing on how bird two deals with this scenario. Okay. So what we need to set up here uh -huh. is our variables. Okay. And this is one of the complicated situations with evolutionary game theory. Okay. There's some creativity that has to go in to know what equations to put in these boxes. Okay. So when we look at this scenario, uh -huh. there are two things that happen. We need to know our reward. And we also need to know that for the instance when they fight, there is a cost that goes along with fighting. Right, of course, it, it takes energy. Exactly, to fight. it takes energy, it takes time, uh -huh. you can injure yourself, right. there can be negatives to fighting for your food. Right. And these costs don't apply to individuals who share. Okay. Because if they, they can either share it or they will just walk away. Uh -huh. So when a fighter encounters a fighter, uh -huh. their payoff is going to be their reward uh -huh. minus the cost it takes to get it. Uh -huh. And then it's divided by two because it will be between the two. Okay, so we're assuming that bird one and bird two are equally strong. Yes. And when they f fight for that piece of meat, they're uh, going to split that piece of meat uh, in, into, into two, but because they had to expend some energy to fight for that food, uh, they, the, the, the net benefit of getting that meat is 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 uh, reduced reduced because, yeah. by by that c in the numerator by the cost okay. exactly and this is a zero sum game meaning okay. whatever one individual takes uh -huh. it is deducted from the other right in our next scenario bird 2 encounters bird 1 uh -huh. bird 2 is a fighter uh -huh. bird 1 is a sharer meaning he does not want to fight at all right in this scenario bird 2 wins the hole uh -huh. because the sharer will see the aggression, uh -huh. not bother, doesn't want to spend the time, doesn't want to endure the cost, right. and will leave. Right. And just to remind everybody here, the, the, the payoffs in these matrices are what happens to bird number two. Bird number right? two so, yes. so that's why, that's why here the, the end result here is the whole reward because the whole reward in this particular scenario goes to bird, to bird number two. two. Okay. And now we'll look at what happens if bird two is a sharer. Uh -huh. In the first scenario, bird two who shares encounters bird one who fights. Uh -huh. In this case, bird two gets nothing. Gets nothing. Right. He sees the scenario, he sees the fighter, goes, I don't want any of that, I'm not gonna incur a cost. Right. You can have it all. Right. In scenario two, bird two who shares uh -huh. encounters another individual who shares. Uh -huh. In this case, they each split the reward equally. Right, but there's no cost 
because they didn't fight. They didn't exactly. expend energy to fight. They just chose to to share and, and, and split the meat into two. Exactly. There's no time invested in posturing or acting aggressive. There's no right. energy expent in fighting. Right. So they share the reward equally. Yeah. Okay. And and just to just to uh, be generalizable, we've used the pronoun he yes. in this whole example, but uh, I would imagine that that in in the animal kingdom. There are some species where the the females are the ones who are fighting or, oh, or most, getting food. Most definitely. In any of these scenarios, it could be a male or a female, right. especially when it comes to something like food. Uh -huh. It could be male encountering male, male encountering female. Oh, really? Female encountering female. Oh, I didn't know that. There, okay. there are a lot of situations where gender... I, I suppose, yeah. why not? Why, yeah. why, why, why couldn't I... I that that yeah, I, sh I shouldn't yeah. have been so astonished. Of course, a male could be fighting with yeah. a female. Why the, not? Gen yeah. Gender has no place. That was simply the pronouns that we chose. Yes, yes, okay. So when we look at this matrix, yeah, it seems that to be a fighter, you have a much larger benefit. Yeah, in some of your encounters, uh -huh. because it's a random coin flip, fifty-fifty. Uh -huh. You could encounter a fighter or a sharer. Uh -huh. You're either going to get all of it, or uh -huh. you might get. A bit less than half, uh -huh. but you still have a chance to win it all. All right. So, what we did, or what was used by Axelrod, was he looked at various ranges of situations. Ah. But the two main ones are a low cost and a high cost. Ah, uh, okay. So if we look at this through some math, we apply values to these situations. Okay. We'll set our reward at one. An arbitrary number, the okay. reward in this case just needs to be a solid, tangible value. Okay. So if we take this situation and we give it a low cost. Okay. Let's say the cost here is 0 0.01. Okay. Again, it's an arbitrary number. It's a relative, essentially. Okay. Thank you. No problem. And what we look at is... If we punch it into these equations, in this case, our result, 0 0.495, I believe it was. I want to make sure I have that right. Yep. Four. Here, 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 here. Yeah. We'll, 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 yeah, we'll, we'll remove we'll, these. We'll, 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 here, we'll, we'll go. So R, yep. R minus C over 2 is equal, equal to... to 0 0.49. Or, or sorry, yeah, I should punch in the actual numbers. Yes. Sorry. So Here, in this I scenario, we're going to go 1 minus 0 0.01 divided by 2, and we're going to get 0 0.495. Yes. Okay. Okay. And here, I'll, I'll do this work. Yeah. You, you, of course. You've explained a lot of the theory. So in the fight and share, in the fight and share, the reward is is one. Yep. Right? The fighter gets it all. Right. And here it's one over two. One over two. Okay. Okay. So that's the scenario where there's a low cost. Exactly. And okay. when you look at it, it's quite obvious. It's better to be a fighter in here. You can win the whole of the pie, all of it, uh -huh. all of your reward. Or if you do encounter a fighter, the difference is very, very small here. Ah. Your cost is almost negligible. Ah. In this case, what would happen is if we have a population, uh -huh. and I'll make sure that we can see it down here in this corner, let's take a population over time. Uh -huh. So we'll have time across our x-axis, uh -huh. and this is our proportion of population. So, sorry, I think, I, I think uh, uh, yeah. that might be a little bit too small. Yeah, not a problem. Right, right. We'll, we'll, if, um, uh, what we can do is we'll go back to that then. Uh, okay. After. Okay. okay. But I think I think we generally understand that the key point here, which is, if it's if it if the cost is low, then the the payoff between uh, these two cells is the, is the payoffs minuscule. between the payoffs between these two cells are almost the same. The, exactly. The, the difference between these two. Are, is minuscule exactly and therefore the dominant strategy for bird two regardless of what bird one does is to fight exactly right? because if, if if bird two chooses to fight then at, at the very minimum you'll get roughly 0.5 
Yep. And at the maximum, you can get one. one. Whereas if you share, regardless of what bird one does, at the minimum, you could get zero, and at most, you can get 0.5, which is... So at most, you would get 0.5 in this scenario, which is this strategy, barely, which is the minimum, roughly the minimum exactly. of this strategy. So the dominant strategy for bird number two would be is, to fight. It would be to fight. So this is so this is the low cost. So here I'll write this yeah. is the low cost cost scenario. Yes. Scenario. Okay. Precisely. Okay. However, if we look at this from a different way, where okay. our cost is much larger. Okay. Let's say in this case, you, uh, we use a cost of 0 0.5. 0, okay, so 0 0.5. So this is, we're not going to call this We're going to look cost. at our high cost. Okay, so this is the high cost scenario. And yep. The cost is 0 0.5. Okay, so now. If we punch it in, we see 1 minus 0 0.5 over 2. So then this would be equal to zero now. Uh, 0 0.25. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, case. I'm sorry. Yeah. Goodness sakes, I'm messing up on basic arithmetic here. <laughs> this is awful. Okay, so it's been a long one period. minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5. 0 0.5 divided by two is 0 0.25. Precisely. Okay. Goodness. This and is awful. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so. And, and our everything else remains the same. Everything else remains because the same. So our, this is the reward. Is which one. Is, which is still one. And the and the payoff here is reward over two, two. which is still, still one over one. two. Okay. So what we're seeing now is once the cost starts to increase, uh -huh. you start to get less and less benefit uh -huh. as a fighter. Uh -huh. So even though your payoff may be as high as one, uh -huh. your payoff can still be quite low. Uh -huh. And what happens here is depending on proportions in the population, it starts to become worse and worse to be a fighter. Um, because as fighters become b more and more abundant in the population, uh -huh. you're more likely to start getting a lower payoff uh -huh. than a sharer in their optimal situation. Ah, uh, okay. So, and what we can see is this cost, in theory, can be can reach as high as 0 0.9, 0 0.95. Mm -hmm. In which case, this is so minuscule, this reward, uh -huh. it's equivalent to zero, uh -huh. essentially. Uh -huh. And that creates the balance between fighting and sharing. Okay. Okay. So if if you don't mind, if I remove this, yeah. So, and, so, so I just want to, yep. Just want to review something here. Mm -hmm. So, so in this scenario, yeah. In this scenario, there 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 isn't a dominant strategy. Correct. Right. There, because because if you if regardless of what bird one does, you fight mm -hmm. the bird two fights. That the payoff could be quite much small. much smaller than this, yep. or much bigger than this. Yes. So it's ambiguous whether fighting is is going clearly to always better. be advantageous or clearly always going to be disadvantageous. Precisely right. So so sometimes depending on on what bird one does, uh, bird two should alter its strategy as well to maximize precisely. The Right, and that okay. and that is where we get into what is called a stable strategy, uh -huh. which sh which is a state where a behavior is constant, and while it will fluctuate in the population in terms uh -huh. of how much of the population uses a certain behavior, uh -huh. it will never completely vanish. Uh -huh. So what I'll do now is I'll show using a time graph uh -huh. what we did, what I just discussed there. Okay, okay. So okay. I'll remove this. And if we look at a graph spanning across time, so on our x-axis, we will have time. On our y-axis, uh -huh. we will have the proportion of the population. Uh -huh. So I'll put prop for proportion of pop for population. Okay. So we have our two strategies. Mm -hmm. Let's say we start with a very high number of sharers and a low number of fighters. What we will see is as time progresses, uh -huh. the share population will start to decline 
because at low proportions, the fighter will win more uh -huh. encounters. Uh -huh. And what we see is roughly around an equilibrium point, and this equilibrium point fluctuates. It depends on what the costs are. Okay. So if the cost is very high, uh -huh. then we might see an equilibrium point where there are fewer fighters and more sharers. Uh -huh. And what happens here is they start to alternate. So the fighters might be better for a short period of time, uh -huh. but as their population gets too high, uh -huh. it becomes advantageous to start sharing again. Okay. And the fighter population starts to dip uh -huh. while sharing increases. Okay. And we see this fluctuation within a norm uh -huh. continuously across time. Uh -huh. So as soon as the behaviors are established, we will see a very small change in proportions of population that express each behavior, mm -hmm. but we will never see one completely overtake the other. Okay. okay. Because if everyone starts sharing, mm -hmm. you get the advantage of being a fighter again. Uh -huh. If fighters start to take over, sharers start to get uh -huh. a lot more. Okay. So, at the beginning, yes. if most birds are sharers, yep. then let's say if all of the birds except you mm -hmm. are sharers and you are a fighter, then you don't have anybody to, to compete with, Precisely. which is why you're going to start to dominate yep. the, or the fighters are going to start to dominate. Yep. So what okay. will happen there is my strategy uh -huh. will start to become more effective uh -huh. and depending how that strategy spreads, uh -huh. if it spreads through genes, meaning if I get more food, uh -huh. I have a better chance of having offspring. Uh -huh. And I share that fighting gene with offspring, right. meaning as time progresses, more and more fighters will start to appear in the population. Right. If in this case, it's simply a choice, you choose uh -huh. to either fight or share at the beginning of any interaction. Uh -huh. If everyone starts off sharing, uh -huh. and I start off fighting, uh -huh. and I'm the only one, uh -huh. Other sharers will start to see that strategy works, uh -huh, uh -huh. and they will start to fight as well, ah, okay. which will show within a single generation oh, or okay. a short time span okay. across generations. So the strategy could be passed on because it's innate in your genetics, and yep. you, you pass it on through reproduction. Yeah, which or, we would see a slower okay. build, or, or if, if you learn fighting through observation, yep. then it, it could be passed just between members of the same species in, in, in the same generation. In the same generation. And what we'd see is it would happen faster. Okay. Because you don't have this time of waiting between generations. Ah, uh, okay. So it gets picked up and then it starts to go through its Okay. Alternation. Okay. So, so just to be clear, this right here is uh, learning. This is this. It's is, a cultural. Okay. So it's it's learning. Yep. Okay. Learning to fight. Learning to fight. Whereas, whereas the, whereas the black is uh, 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 fighting is genetic. F fighting is genetic. Okay. Yeah, that's that's a good way of. Fighting is genetic. Okay. Now, l let's let's talk about what uh, what happens after this equilibrium. Because mm -hmm. I, I get I get what you you're saying up to this point. But suppose that in a, in a flock of birds, I'm the only sharer. Everybody yep. else is a fighter. Mm -hmm. Just superficially, and then perhaps yeah. I'm not thinking very deeply here. But if if I'm the only sharer, I struggle to understand how my strategy could become dominant. And that's the interesting thing. That is why, as we saw, that is why these two, uh -huh. uh, fighting is genetic and fighting is learning, uh -huh. have very different implications. Okay. So when fighting is genetic, sharing will only survive uh -huh. if it is dominant. Uh -huh. Because if everyone's a fighter, a sharer can't interject. Yes. And that's why we see, in some cases, species where everyone will always be fighting. There uh -huh. is no cooperation uh -huh. because the sharing genes uh -huh. don't have a chance to spread. Uh -huh. Whereas if it's a behavioral thing, 
Ah. You start to see tit for tat. Ah, if okay. one decides to share, so uh-huh. let's say it is a fighter and a share interact. Uh-huh. The fighter starts taking everything, but the share is able to go in and get a little bit without uh-huh. any fight back. Okay. What happens is that that behavior can uh-huh. start to spread, and you can have tit for tat. I shared with you. Uh-huh. Then you're going to share with me uh-huh, uh-huh. in the future because you're not going to have to expend the cost of fighting me. Ah, uh, right. And as that happens more and more, uh-huh. sharing starts to develop. Okay. And that is the idea of tit for tat, where you actually are able to remember the individual you interacted with. Okay. But if it, again, I'm not mm-hmm. a biologist, of course, but. It, thinking about natural selection, mm-hmm. if if a trait becomes advantageous, yep. shouldn't natural selection then select for it and through genetics make it more prevalent in the population? And and we do see that. Okay, but the difference there is at, is it's situational. Okay, natural selection evolution is based on the conditions that you are currently in. Uh, okay. So there is no standard baseline for how evolution works. It's okay. based on all of the all of the pressures that are applied on a population or an individual. Right. So we can see scenarios where if there's an abundance of food, uh-huh. where there's more food than individuals, uh-huh. we might not even have to see this dynamic. Right. And we would see a population that will just constantly avoid. Right. But if that resource starts to constrict, there becomes less and less food, and conflicts start between okay. individuals, then we can see the development of sharing and fighting uh-huh. occur. Uh-huh. At which point, given the circumstances that the population is under, the pressures, we will see the development and the evolution of strategies. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So, uh, to to try to summarize what you said in Mm -hmm. in somewhat simpler terms. I think what you're trying to say is these dynamics depend on the rewards and the costs in the environment of of this animal species. Okay. Now for these particular graphs that you drew, are they, are they low cost? Are they high cost? Or is it, are these curves applicable to to either case? In in this case, Uh This would be a, depending on what you determine, if you say, let's say this is 50% because it's roughly halfway up, Uh this would probably be, and it again depends on situations, where the cost is medium high Okay. because as the cost becomes higher, you're going to have fighting as a less advantageous Uh because, so Uh you'll see this equilibrium sit down in this area more. Uh Okay. Or if the costs are lower, this equilibrium might sit up higher where Uh fighters are more Uh prevalent. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. Interesting. So just to put some concrete understanding of this, can Mm -hmm. you give us an example of an animal species that's predominantly consisted of fighters? Consistent with fighters. I'm just, um, just uh, yeah. for my guess, would lions be mostly fighters? Outside of their pride? Yes. yes we, oh, okay. we see a lot of fighting. Okay. And this fighting behavior can go across species as well. Okay. Where we can ha- see a, spe- a species A uh-huh. will eat a lot, a large amount of it, but won't fight species B for the scraps. Ah, okay. So okay. it's not just within a population, it can be between species. Ah, okay. It's uh, from where Axelrod originally took it, uh-huh. he looked at within a species, Okay. Uh, these conflicts, these fighting. Uh-huh. An example of a species that would, that would, within its species, have this interaction. I can't think of a specific one off the top of my head, uh-huh. but I can tell you there are a lot of predatory species. Uh-huh. Um, for example, apex predators, you more likely see fighting be a constant thing, like sharks. Apex? Apex. Oh, apex. Oh, predators yeah. who are at the top at of the, the very food top. They're, they're of a food chain. Okay. They are above everyone. No one 
hunts them. Right. Okay. They're at the top of the chain looking down. Okay. So apex predators tend to be fighters? Not or, or, always. Or, 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 or they, they go through... Uh, they alternate between sharing and fighting. They, they can be sharers. They can be fighters. Depending on... It depends on the, 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 species. the species and the social behavior. For right. example, if we look at lions, they're a fairly social species. They're... Uh-huh the most social of the wild cat species. Uh-huh. So we may not see fighting as often. Uh-huh. Whereas if you look at a species that is a loner species, very individualistic. Uh-huh. Um, let's go back to something such as a great white. A and great I'm, white shark. Yeah. Okay. And I can't say for certain uh-huh. because I don't know the numbers behind their behaviors. Uh-huh. But I wouldn't be surprised to see an individual species, an individualistic species, a uh-huh. lone predator be more of a fighter to the point where there might not be any sharing within okay. that population. Okay. It, it has a lot to do with the sociality okay. of the species. As well. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's introducing another factor into yes. this is because we haven't, we're, we're, I, I, I am pushing Mitchell to, to really expand on this topic, but, but we're, we're, we're confining, we're not talking about soci- sociality and, in, in the context of this episode. So we're, we're just talking about rewards and costs. Yeah. Right. Um, it, are there species that are mostly, if not exclusively, shares? Again, I can't name any species off the top okay. of my head. Okay. But you see in... It might not be fighting sharing, uh-huh. but in a lot of what the term is eusocial okay. animals where... Everyone works to the benefit of a few. For example, if you look at bees ah, or ants. Bees where, or ants, right. Where okay. everyone is working for the queen. Right, right. So all of that, all, they're sharing their their rewards. They're going out gathering food. Right. So their queen and the offspring of the queen uh-huh. can reap the rewards. Uh-huh. Even though these worker bees don't ever get to have children, uh-huh. they're still working to the benefit of their their right. population. Yeah, yeah. Just as someone who has a rather uh, uh, cursory understanding of biology, I, I, I haven't heard of any stories of bees fighting against each other or ants fighting against each other With, very much. Not, not to my understand I, anyway my specialty isn't in invertebrates uh-huh. but again that i do know of scenarios where there are conflicts but they are almost always between populations or uh, okay because or a new queen has arrived and is trying to ah, take over okay but within a single colony, it's not as likely. It's, okay, they're they're mostly going to share with each other. Exactly. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, uh, sir, did you have something else you wanted to add? Oh no. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Okay. So yeah. So so we've we've seen how game theory can help to explain why sharing could become prevalent if not dominate in a population even mm-hmm. though it seems like it's a somewhat of a disadvantage a disadvantageous behavior okay yes uh, and and the uh, the, the so so the, the strategy is you you either you're either fighting or you're sharing um, are there are there cases of, of game theory where in, in animal behavioral ecology where it's more complicated than that. Yes, um, we have another example that I will show okay. that looks at what is known as mate desertion. Okay. So after a male and female have mated, they've uh-huh. had their offspring, uh-huh. there is, in some populations, occurrences where either the male, the female, or both will simply leave. Ah, they will right. leave and let their offspring, their children, uh-huh. fend for themselves, uh-huh. which is another situation where it doesn't seem advantageous. Uh-huh. Why would you put your offspring, uh-huh. your guaranteed children that you've already had, uh-huh. at risk uh-huh. to leave and potentially have more? Right. So I will set up our game matrix for that. Yeah, yeah. And this is a situation 
that is a little more complicated because it is not a zero sum. Uh -huh. So the when one parent benefits, it's not to the direct detriment of the other. It isn't mm -hmm. you're taking part of the pie away. Uh -huh. okay. So if we set up this matrix, we have our two individuals, we have our mother and our father. Mm -hmm. And we have the two behaviors that can go along with it. Mm -hmm. The choice to stay The father can choose to stay, the mother can choose to stay. Or, the alternative decision, they can choose to leave. Uh -huh. So, we have our, we have our situation. We have can, can I draw another vertical bar yeah, here? Yeah, of just course. To, just to, yes, thank you. I uh, forgot. No worries. No worries. No worries. Okay. So uh, just uh, just to clarify some things mm -hmm. here, when we say stay and leave, we mean not just their sexual relationship between the father and the mother, but whether they should stay to take care of their offspring, to yes. take care of the children, or to abandon their children. Exactly. The, okay. the common used terms are care and abandon for a bit of an easier understanding on what the behavior is. Right. We've chosen stay with the offspring and care, uh -huh. or leave, leave and abandon them. Right. And and um, second thing I think we should we should clarify is that if one of the mates decides to leave they could choose to mate with a third yes um, member of the species yes the, this this can go from father with mother one to uh -huh. father and mother two uh -huh. all the way down to father and mother three and so uh -huh. on uh -huh. depending on how much time there is for mating season and other potential conflicts yeah what whether whether the the father could find another mother to, to mate with, whether the father can compete with other fathers to mate Precisely. with the mother. And, and conversely as well, right? So, exactly. so mothers could also Choose leave. Uh, mothers could also look for another mate. Precisely. Right. Okay. So that is actually where we get into the creativity of uh -huh. evolutionary game theory. Uh -huh. Right there. Uh -huh. So, um, and, and sorry, just one more caveat. Of course, of course. I, 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 I'm, I'm spoiling the fun here. Mitchell's, oh, Mitchell's all excited to explain the theory, and I, I keep adding these caveats. Okay, so one more caveat, not about the science, but more, more just about the, the terminology here. When we say abandon the children, whether there's a cost to abandon the children or not, we, we, we obviously recognize that from a human point of view, ab abandoning children is a morally bad thing to do. Yeah. Okay? Um, in, in this particular con context, we're saying that abandoning the children could be good or bad purely for the sake of the, the father's and mother's um, genetics, uh, genetics their, their, their desire to, to, to spread their genes uh, as, as much as possible to, to as many offspring Precisely. as possible, right? Precisely. So, 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 that, so, so when we say abandoning or, or staying their, with their children is good or bad, it's purely with respect to that objective of spreading their genes. There's nothing about the morality of the situation. There's nothing, nothing to do with um, the emotional cost to, to the parents or the children, right? We're, we're not talking, about, we obviously acknowledge that those costs do exist, but in this particular discussion we're confining purely to whether or not it's it's good for the spreading of the genes of the father and the mother. I'll quickly give a bit more space here because one of our equations will be a bit longer. Okay. Okay. But okay. yes, it is definitely okay. we don't we're not discussing morals, we're discussing fitness. Yes. Which is your ability, as Eric said, to spread your genetics, yeah. to get your genes into the next generation and make it more numerous. Right, right. Okay. So uh, so the first situation is both parents decide to stay and take care of their kids. Yeah. So before we get into each of these quadrants, uh -huh. I want to get into that creativity behind evolutionary game theory. So okay. you were discussing it precisely. There's costs and benefits to all of these things. And the issue and 
the difficulty with creating any evolutionary game theory matrix uh -huh. is figuring out the equations. Uh, okay. So when we look at this, we have to know what are variables and what can be altered. Uh -huh. So we'll start by stating what our variables are. Uh -huh. So we will say the number of, in, of offspring a female can have uh -huh. if she stays, uh -huh. we will call that W. So number of offspring if the mother stays. So that's our first variable. Okay. Our next variable, we'll look at the mothers again, uh -huh. is how many offspring she can have if she abandons. Okay. So when she leaves, she has the benefit of W, the children she's already had, plus however many offspring she can have further. Uh -huh. And there's a reason why we use A as opposed to W times 2 uh -huh. or W times 3. And that is, for females, it takes a certain amount of energy just to produce the offspring, let alone uh, of course. be able to care for it. Uh -huh. So within a single mating season, it's possible that she can mate multiple times, uh -huh. but she won't be able to produce as many <coughs> offspring the next time she mates, uh, uh -huh. okay. because it's so much of a toll, it takes so much energy uh -huh. to produce that first set of kids. Uh -huh. She can't be; a she's not physically able to make the same number again. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So this is our number of offspring if abandoned. Now, just to be clear, this is the number of new offspring. Should we? This is total offspring. Oh, A, so A is the number of total offspring. Offspring, if she abandons. So oh, okay. it encompasses W. Oh, I see. Oh, and see, I, see, I see. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, now, now you, you mentioned the cost of the woman. Mm -hmm. Sorry, not the woman. Cost the, of the mother uh, if she abandons and, and tries to have children again. Mm -hmm. and, and you're saying that the cost comes from the, the, the energy that... It comes from the labor, from yeah. from giving birth. And, what, and gestating. And gestating, okay. But what about the cost of looking for a new male partner? Is there a cost to a mother for, for looking for a, a new male sexual partner? In very specific situations, there can be, but the general consensus and what we see in a lot of species that produce sexually, they have two genders, uh -huh. is females are the choosy, Sex. Uh, okay. So they don't have this risk associated with having to find another mate. Okay. It's very, very likely across a large number of species that the females will be able to have a mate if they so choose. Okay. So, so in in this scenario, consistent with what ecologists have generally observed for mm -hmm. animals, we're assuming that the cost of looking for a new mate is zero for a mother. Yes, it is so minuscule that it is essentially zero. Okay. And right. that, that's the situation that we will be working with in this framework. Okay. okay. So our next variable that we want to look at is for both the male and the female, the mother and the father. Okay. And this is three variables that encapsulate the same idea. Okay. And they are the probabilities that an offspring will survive. Uh -huh. Given how many, given no, none of the parents are caring, only one or both are uh, so, caring. So there are three scenarios here. Uh, there are three uh, scenarios. So, so an offspring could could have no parents, one parent, or two parents caring for them. Caring yes. for them. Okay. So those are P zero for no parents are caring. Uh -huh. P one. Uh -huh. For one parent caring, it could be the father, it could be the mother, uh -huh. we don't differentiate. Or P2, mm -hmm. and P2 is the probability that the offspring will survive given both parents caring. Okay. So now that we've looked at everything that the mother needs, uh -huh. there's one final variable that we need to consider. Uh -huh. And it's as you brought up, do females have to find, is there a cost to finding a new female? Uh -huh. While there isn't for a female, there is for a male. Okay. Males don't have this ability and this ease of, if they abandon, easily finding a male. Generally speaking, generally speaking. For, for anim in, in, in animal ecology, generally speaking, uh, fathers who want to find a new mate need to expend some energy to do so. 
In in this case, we aren't looking at expending energy. Okay. We're looking at the probability of. Oh, that I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you not, for the clarification. Right. So no so so sorry. So uh, just because a, uh, a a male wants to mate with a female doesn't mean that he will. He is guaranteed. Uh, he's guaranteed to find a female to to mate with him. Precisely. So, so there's there's a, a a probability that the male. Will will succeed, but it it it, it means that it also it, it, it's possible that the, the male, despite trying uh, to look for me, could could not be able to do so. Exactly, and right. that is our final variable. Okay. We will call it M for mating. Okay. So this is our probability oh, probability that male finds a new. Me. Sorry, Mitch. Can we write that just a, a bit bigger? I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, of sorry, course. Here, yeah, I'm here. Come, come a little. You can come this way and, and make sure that you write that nice Thank and you. big for for everybody to see. Finds a new mate. Okay. So now that we have found and determined all of our variables, uh -huh. we can start breaking down how each quadrant of this matrix works. Okay. And because it's a non-zero sum, what we have to do is we have to break each quadrant into the male and the female. Ah, okay. So there's a difference for each scenario between uh -huh. the male and the female. Okay. okay. So we'll make this bottom corner here uh -huh. The male. Uh -huh. And then the top right corner will be the female's equation uh -huh. and how it affects them. Okay. So, in the case of both parents deciding to stay, we have the number of offspring if the mother stays mm -hmm. because they are each only having one mate, one set of offspring. Okay. So they each have a W. Uh -huh. And then there are two parents caring for them. So we have our P2 value, which is the probability of offspring surviving given both parents caring. Right. Okay, so we see so, so it's even. So this is this is also just yes. I want to make sure this is nice and big for everybody to see. So this of is course. W WP2 for both the mother and yeah, the father. They okay. they see the same they see the same reward and the same outcome. Okay. Okay. Now let's look at if the father stays and the mother leaves. Yeah. Why, don't, why don't I try to do this? Yep. Uh, okay, so... If, so let's if, focus on the father first. Okay, so if, if the mother leaves, then... But the father stays, then there's... it's We're using P1. P1, correct. Okay. okay. Uh, now, for the father... Uh, the father only has W to work with. Precisely. Right? So then it would be W times P1. I'm yes, guessing, exactly. Right? Okay, so, so here it's W times P1. Yep. Okay. Now, for the mother, mm -hmm. uh, are we assuming that if the mother mates with another male that, sh that um, she and this new male partner are both going to stay? No. Oh, no, we can't make that assumption. We can't make that assumption. So we oh, have to okay. work off the assumption that only one parent will be caring for this new set of offspring as well. Ah, so we're, we're taking the worst case scenario. So, exactly. Okay. And there's another reason why we have to do that. Okay. And that is because, remember, our A value also encapsulates W. Okay. Yes. So if we were to put P2 there, we'd be saying that the first set of children that this female has is being cared for by two parents. And that's, that's wrong. Which is wrong. Okay. But, but uh, would it make sense to break, break the, the um, calculation into the, the children who were first deserted and the new children? Or is that just too complicated? It, it becomes too complicated in part because we don't know what the next interaction oh, is Oh, because, because, be. because the mother could mate with a second male. And choose to leave. And choose to leave and mate with a third male and choose to leave. Exactly. Oh, or she okay. could mate with the second male and the male could choose to leave. Oh, or they could okay. both choose to stay. There, right. are, there are so many permutations right. beyond our first decision 
right. that we don't want to make assumptions and we can't right. make these assumptions. Okay, so it's so so we're we're making the simplification here mm -hmm. because partially to simplify partially because the calculation is simpler, but partially because we just don't know what, what the subsequent outcome is. Precisely. We, we can't see the future. We can't tell what will happen in the next okay. encounter. So, so, so an, an easy but also somewhat sensible assumption is uh, that any subsequent children that this mother has will be cared for by at least one parent. Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to say it's uh, A times P1. Correct. Okay. Should these, should these be capital W's given that this is A is a capital? No. no, there's, no. There, Ed, with these sorts of things, we can apply our own variables okay, for okay, them. Okay, okay, okay. So, so I, just no want to, I just want to be consistent because yeah. the number of children in this case is a capital A, so I wondered yeah. if we should. Okay. No worries, no worries. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I, I, I keep interrupting the fun oh, here. <laughs> it's, not, it's not a problem. Let's right. start with the mother in this case. Okay, so the, because this is a this is a less complex okay, scenario. Sorry. So if the mother stays and the father, father leaves, leaves, then uh, there's one there's one parent correct caring for the kids and uh, the number of offspring there must. Mother stays, so it's, it's WP1. WP1. Okay. Precisely. Okay. So now let's take a look at what happens to, if the if the if for the father. Okay. Yep. So for the father. Okay. So if the father leaves. Mm -hmm. um, he's not going to care. He's not going to care for these. Correct. Uh, so which of these p values would we be using? Uh, Remember, we're making yeah, the same yeah, assumption yeah, as up yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. So the mother is staying. So yes. I think it's I, I think it's W P one plus whatever um, offspring that the that the father could possibly possibly have. In subsequent sexual relationships. Very, very close, actually. Okay. Very close. So I'll write down the equation. Okay. And we'll see. Or the expression. Yeah, the yeah, expression. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. So we have W, P1, P1, which you were right. Yeah. Because it is the first mating. Yeah. And only one parent caring for them. Yeah. Where you were slightly off okay. is that it's not addition, it's 1 plus M. So it's the same way we look at adding tax to something. Okay. So we have what he's already gotten. So if we break this out, what we're seeing is WP1 is multiplied by WP1 uh -huh. the, plus the probability that he can find a new mate. So this value in here uh -huh. augments this right to account for not only the excess number of children he can potentially have, uh -huh. but the probability he'll find them. Right. So uh, what we're so so sorry just mm -hmm. so now we're assuming I think with the same logic about this we're assuming that um, the the children that the father has after this deserting the original children mm -hmm. has one parent because we don't know what's going to happen. Exactly. Like, okay. I, I think I think I am still correct, and uh, let me propose yep. why why I think I'm still correct. I, I think I can see where you're because going. Because this this expression just simplifies the WP one plus uh, WP one times M, right? Yes. So, so it's it's the original children that the yep that the um, genes uh, the, the, it's that the, the original father sired sired in with the original mother. Yep. Plus whatever children that the father could. Sire, yes. With 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 the Precisely. caveat that there's this probability that he may, he may succeed or he may. And, and I think I think you're right. I yeah. think you were right initially. Yeah. I just misinterpreted no, what no you worries. said. This is, but I, I think this is. Hey, this is why we have this talk show because if we start saying everything in English, we can misunderstand each other. Precisely. Right? But if we formalize things with math. Then we're not going to misunderstand each other, it's right? A common so, language. so, so exactly. Okay, so this is why the central equilibrium exists. Okay, 
All right. So so okay. So so we have yep. an agreement here. Okay. Yeah. So let's so move let's, on. Let's move on to these. To okay. Here. So so I'll let you choose if you want to uh, address okay. the father or the mother first. Okay. So they both leave. Yes. Okay. So then so then we're we're working with P zero. P zero. Okay, yeah. So let, let's work let's work with the mother. All right. So it's uh, W times P zero. Remember, she is leaving. Right. She's leaving, but he's leaving as. He's yeah. leaving as well. But we're looking just at the just at the mother, right? Yes. So would she not have A because oh, she is Oh right, 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 right. She is going right, to be right, dating with others. Right, right, right. Okay, so it's it's A times P zero. Yes. Okay. Precisely. Okay, okay. okay. So now Yes, yes, okay. So now we need to think about the male. The male. Okay, so it's it's W times P zero. Correct. I think. Plus, uh, uh, d um. remember the assumptions that we've made yeah, here, yeah, yeah, that yeah. it is a constant. Yeah, so, so, hold on. Uh, yep. So I think it is mm -hmm. it is W P zero times M. That's precisely correct. Okay, okay. And the okay. fact that you sat there and thought about it shows just what we behavioral ecologists deal with. Okay. When even when we're trying to create these, or even for my exam for example, me, yeah. this was actually a graph that we had to do in an exam. Ah. And okay. this was one of the questions that most students struck that the most students struggled with okay because you're trying to take all of this right. and understand situationally uh -huh. and apply each variable situation right right okay okay so we have all of our variables laid out here right so now what we can do is we can start as we did with the other one playing with the numbers uh -huh. for each variable and we can determine depending on a situation uh -huh. whether it is better to stay, whether it is better to leave. Ah, but there are six things that you can manipulate here. Exactly. So it, it's going to be really hard to come up with so I've, broad generalizations. Okay. So I've come up with two scenarios. Okay. We're going to look at from the mother's perspective uh -huh. first, uh -huh. whether she can stay or she should leave uh -huh. using the variables a, P1, and P2. Uh -huh. We're not going to look at P0 because it's the same sort of concept, just a little more okay. in depth. And then we're going to look at the father, uh -huh. whether it is beneficial, given the scenario, uh -huh. to stay or to leave. Okay. Should I erase anything? Yep. For you? Um, if you remove this, okay. I'll start by creating a graph that we can use okay. and assigning values to our variables. So I'll start by trying to visualize this okay. so we can get a clear picture of what we're looking at. Okay. So first we're gonna start with scenario one. Uh -huh. And in scenario one, we're looking from a female's perspective, meaning she has two main behavior choices. She can stay or she can, here, let me make that a little larger. Yes, please, thank you. She can choose to stay, or she can choose to leave. Right. So, the variables that we will be working with uh -huh. in this scenario, for stay, we have our equation of, correction, I'll just write this out so we can clearly see it. If she stays, her equation is W, P2. Uh -huh. We're looking at this from just the both parents are there. Does the female want to leave the male? Okay. And she has leave, which is A P1. Okay. So the number of offspring she can sire okay. if she leaves. So, so we're, we're assuming that the father is going to stay. Yep. So now we're asking, is the mother going to leave. Better okay. off to leave or stay. Okay. So, so, so what here, what, so scenario. Scenario one. 
Scenario number one. The father stays. Yep. So the question is, should the mother leave? leave? Okay. So now that we know our scenario and we know what uh, expressions we're working with, uh -huh. let's assign our values. So this first scenario, what we will be looking at is where the a value, so the number of offspring she will sire if she leaves, uh -huh. will be larger than the w value if she stays. Okay. So let's assign our values here. So we'll give w a value of 2.2, .2, meaning on average she can have 2.2 .2 offspring if she stays. Okay. And we'll assign a the number of offspring she can have if she chooses to leave uh -huh. as 3.6. So this means, uh -huh. in theory, she can have an average of 3.6 offspring uh -huh. if she chooses to leave. Uh huh. And 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 this is higher than this because she could have multiple mating partners after leaving the the first father. Yes. Right. So in theory, she can go and only mate with one other, uh -huh. which will add 1.4 in this case. Uh -huh. Or she could choose to continually mate with male after male, which would right. reach us to this right. Number. Right. So we have these two, and we're going to fix them between the two situations the mother faces. Okay. What we're going to play with here is our P1 and our P2 values. Okay. So this first scenario, we are going to make P1 very similar to P2. Okay. So we'll assign P1 the probability that an off that the offspring will survive with okay. only one parent caring for it. We will give that a value of zero point. Six two. Okay. Sixty two percent chance all of these offspring survive. Okay. And we will give P two the probability that the offspring will survive if both parents care uh -huh. as zero point six five. Okay. So this is a situation where these are quite different, uh -huh. but these are fairly similar. Right. So I think it's it's important to point out that this should always we're assuming that this is always going to be bigger than this exactly right it, it will always be bigger the question is the magnitude right and the okay. same could be said for p0 right p, all three of these could be within five percent of each other or right. there could be a, a large difference right okay. so let's start at our baseline so if she stays her maximum potential number uh -huh. is the w value right right i'll make that larger so the maximum potential she can have would be 2.2 individuals. Uh -huh. Whereas if she leaves, she can have an upwards of 3.6 individuals. Uh -huh. But those, these bars that you just drew do not take these survival probabilities into account. Precisely. Okay. So what we see here is with W, if they stay, uh -huh. 2.2 multiplied by 0 0.62. So here, I'll draw yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. I'll write that out down here. Yeah, yeah. So W P2 is equal to 2.2 multiplied by Zero point, sorry, zero point six five. Zero point six five. Because they're, she, she's staying, so they, so the value that we're looking at is P two. I was saying too many numbers and started writing no, out. No worries, no worries, no worries, no worries. So when we make this, when we look at this equation, our outcome here is one point seven eight. Okay. Now, it's an important thing that we need to distinguish. This does not necessarily mean the number of offspring she will have. This is a arbitrary fitness value. Okay. So it is relative to the other decisions. Okay. So if we look at 1.78, let's say that is roughly, if you don't mind me using yeah. this, roughly here. Okay. So this is the potential but given pro survival probabilities, yeah. the actual sits down here at 1.78.
Okay. And if we do the same for if she chooses to leave, we have A multiplied by P1. In this case, that is 3.6 multiplied by 0 0.62. Uh -huh. And the result of that equation is 2.23. 2.23. Which let's say is roughly here, slightly over the maximum potential, right? Not including fitness, right? So given this situation, uh -huh. it's better for the mother to leave, right? Her fitness, if she leaves, two point two three, uh -huh. is larger than the fitness of if she stays, uh -huh. one point seven eight. Uh huh. So this is our first scenario. Uh huh. But if we change our scenario, so we'll keep it as the father stays, should the mother leave, uh -huh. but we're going to play with P1 and P2. Okay. So if we change these two variables, yeah. let's say we keep W and A the same, and we make it so that P1 is significantly less than P2, meaning if both parents are there, mm -hmm. the probability of offspring surviving goes way up. Okay. So, we'll assign the values. P1, in this case, uh -huh. we're going to make a lot smaller, and we are going to make it 0 0.4. Okay. If both parents stay, we are going to give a probability that the offspring will survive of 0 0.81. Okay, so let me... Let me... Here, I'll, 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 this. Do, I'll do these. Yep. Right, okay, so, and we can remove these up here as well. Thank you, Eric. Okay, so, so now we're going to multiply 2.2 by 0 0.81. Okay, and what is that equal to, Mitchell? Uh, 1.78. 1.78. Eight. Uh, hold on, hold on. Didn't you get? Oh, one? sorry. Uh, one point four three was the correct number. Sorry, I had my numbers lined okay. up wrong. Okay. Okay. So what should have read here? Uh, okay. So so let okay so yeah. let let's let's okay so okay. I apologize. Okay. So so let let's just go back. Okay. Yep. So so let's and make sure our numbers. Yes. Are. Okay. So if if P one is equal to zero point six two. Okay. And P two is equal to zero point six five. Okay. Okay. Our numbers here. Okay, so 2.2 times 0 0.62 is equal to 1.43. 1.43. Okay. And 3.6 times 0 0.65 is 2.23. We were correct on that one. 2.23. Okay. Yeah. So, so our results. So so we'll say instead, we'll say that that 0. Point, uh, that 1.43 is down here. So that gives us our 1.43. Okay. And again, we'll say that's yep. 1.43. Okay. And then we have again our 2.23, which sits all the way up here. Okay. So the the result is the same. Okay. Just we're making sure we have the right numbers now. Okay. So in this case, it's even more beneficial right. for her to leave. Okay. It is far better if she leaves than if she stays. Okay. So now let's go to the next scenario where P1 is a lot lower than P2. Yes. Okay. So here's your, here's the best. So, so, so let's correct, yep. change those numbers now. Thank you very much for catching that. No worries. And we have 0 0.81. So, if we put our equations together, okay. times 0 0.81, we come out with a value of 1.78. 1.78, and then 3.6 times 0 0.4 comes out to 1.44. 1.44, ah! So, what we have now is, if she leaves, uh -huh. what she's actually going to experience as fitness is going to be sitting down here, Whereas if she stays, uh, she'll have a fitness of 1.78, which is up here. Uh, so so it, even it, though 
the number of offspring she could potentially have uh -huh. doesn't change uh -huh. simply by changing how effective two parents caring uh -huh. compared to one parent caring uh -huh. changes the dynamics of her decision completely. Ah, uh, so in this case, it would be better for her to stay. Exactly. Right. Her fitness, 1.78 of staying, uh -huh. is larger. Right. Okay, that's that's very interesting. I, I like I like the way you broke this down because this um, makes it more clear to me why a, a mother could have different um, uh, outcomes depending on uh, the, the uh, how a mother's choices could have different outcomes depending on the the parameters that she's working with. Exactly. Right. Okay. So, so um, that is our scenario number one from a mother's perspective. Okay. So if now, we go to scenario two, scenario two, okay, we'll be looking at the opposite. The okay. mother stays. Okay. So the mother stays. Yeah. Okay. So the mother stays. The Should mother the father stays. leave? Should the father leave? Okay. Okay. All right. So I'm going to do a bit of erasing here. Okay. So we can set up for our next situation. Okay. Because we're working with new equations based on the decisions. So for a male, if we look back to the original, uh, the matrix that we created, males do not work with that A value. Mm -hmm. What they work with is W. Uh-huh. For our purposes, P1, P2, because we're only look considering the father leaving, we're uh -huh. guaranteeing the mother stays, and then that chance probability of mating. Uh -huh. Our final variable is M. Okay. So our equations, as before, we'll lay them out here. If the father chooses to stay, the equation same as it was for the female, W, P2. If he chooses to leave, this is where we get into those equations that we focused on uh -huh. and worked our way through. Uh -huh. We have W, P1, 1 plus M, or as you beat me to the punch actually, uh -huh. it can also be expressed as W, P1, plus W P1 multiplied, sorry, let me give it a bit clearer. I tend to use that asterisk. No worries. Multiplied by M. Okay. <clears throat> so, remember how before we stated that this bar for males, uh, for females was W and this one was A? Uh-huh. When we're looking at it from the male's perspective, the, the, the bar should be the same, right? We the have same, same height. Actually, no. Because when he leaves, oh, right, at that right, WP1M right. equation. Right. Okay. So we're looking at, we're removing our probability. Uh, so what we look at initially is W plus W times M. Uh, and that becomes our baseline. Ah, okay, okay. So, we've left W as 2.2. Okay. I'll clean this up a little bit so we don't have as much of a mess. Okay. Right, thank you, good point, right. And now, let's start assigning our values. Right. So, in the first scenario, for males, we will give P1 a value of 0 054 and P2 a value of 0 0.6. So same as that first scenario for the mother, they are very similar. P1 and P2 are very close. Okay. And then we'll give the probability of finding a new mate a fairly high probability. Okay. We'll give him a 77% chance okay. that he'll be able to find a new mate. Okay. So what we'll first do is figure out what this bar is here. Okay. So in that case, it is 2.2 plus 2.2 multiplied by 0 0.77. Okay. So the value for that is, let me look at this and make sure we have this 
proper. Is 3.7. Uh, 3.17. 3.17. Yes, 3.17. Okay, so we'll put it up here. 3.17, slightly below where we had the 3.4 for the female. And this is now our baseline. Okay. If the, if the probabilities of survival were even, mm -hmm. it's obvious the male should leave. But what we need to do is we need to account for that probability. Right. So if we take this WP2 value. Okay, so it's, so WP2 is equal, equal to 2.2. 2.2 times. Multiplied by 0 0.6. 0 0.6, and that's equal to? 1.32. 1.32. Okay. And then our next is our WP1 multiplied by 1 plus m, okay. or WP1 plus WP1 times m, whichever you choose to write. Okay, so that's equal to 2.2 times 0 0.54. Yep. Times. So. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Times one, 1 plus 0 0.77. And that is equal to 2.1. 2.1. Okay. And so in this case, if we draw those dotted lines again, we have 0 1.32 if he stays, which we'll say is about here. Uh -huh. We'll call that 1.32. Right. And if he chooses to leave, 2.1. We'll say that is about here, just below that max. So, if we look at this scenario, with P1 and P2 being very similar, and a high probability of mating, uh -huh. it's better if he leaves. Right. I think, I think just intuitively that, that makes sense. It if, makes sense, yeah. If, if, if leaving doesn't make much of a difference to the survivability of your kids and if you have a fairly high chance of finding a new mate yep then it makes sense that you to, to just leave and try to spread your genes around even more yep it right. makes it makes perfect sense right okay now we're going to take that idea uh -huh. we're going to flip it on its head a little so again we're going to create that second scenario this time a second scenario for the male uh -huh. And we are going to change these variables. We'll keep our W as 2.2. Keep that consistent. What we'll change is P1, P2, and M. So there are two things that we are going to make known here. Uh -huh. The first is that P1 is going to be significantly less than P2. Okay. Let's assign those values. Our P1. 0 0.4 RP2 0 0.81 So there is a very large discrepancy here. Okay. But now we're actually going to add a little twist to this. Our M value, our chance of mating, we're going to increase oh. from the last time. Oh. So we'll make that uh, M value 0 0.83. Okay. So, so if you if the father stays, then the kids are going to have a much higher chance of surviving. But if the father leaves, he's also going to have a much higher chance of finding another mate and yep. and spreading more genes through more children with this second or third or subsequent yep. uh, uh, female partner. Wow. So okay. now so, we so. get into the tricky the tricky bit of it. Okay. And this is why we need the math. This right. is why without game theory and the ability to create equations for this, yeah. we would have no idea right. why a situation like how a situation like this would turn out. Right. Or okay. explain why we'd observe it. Right. So the first thing we'll do is we'll take that W plus W times M equation. Uh -huh. In this case it'll be 2.2. I'll write that out down here. 2.2 plus 2.2 times 0 0.8383. Here, I, I, can, I can write yeah, those. And what's, what's the answer to this? The answer to that 
Give me one second. I had that written down. I don't know where that went. Give me one moment. I'm going to okay. pull out a calculator and do some good old math with this. No worries, no worries. So we have 2.2 plus 2.2 times 0 0.83. Close that bracket. 4.026. 4.026, okay. So if we draw that out, we'll make that bar and see. That's almost that twice as tall, it's almost. almost twice as tall. Okay. So we'll extend that a little bit and call it 4.026. Oh, 4.026, okay. So now let's, let's Let's do the calculations for staying. So if yep. we're going to stay, W P two is equal to two point two multiplied times zero point eight one. Yep, and that's equal to, and that is equal to one point seven eight. One point seven eight. Okay, and then. Um, so yep. you're, you're sure that yes, because this sounds so familiar from yep. the earlier numbers. We, oh, guys, the, the numbers are similar. Okay, okay. So okay, good, good. Okay. So the se the second scenario is our is, uh, WP one WP one multiplied by one plus m. Right. Okay. Yes, well, I can do it that way. So so WP one times one plus m. Uh, that's equal to. 2.2 uh, 2. 2. 2 times 0. 0.4 times 1 plus 0. 0.83. Perfect. And that is equal to? 1.67. 1. 1. Uh, sorry, 1.61. 1. 1.61. 1. 1. 1. 1. Okay. So if we do as we've done, uh, put our dotted lines, Yeah. 1.78, let's say that is roughly about here uh -huh. on this bar, 1.78. Make sure those are mm -hmm. big. Mm -hmm. And then over here, it's 1.61. We'll have that down around here. Okay. Mark that off. 1.61. Sorry, I'm just going to straighten up that seven. Yep. That's, of so course. This, is, this isn't a three. This yeah. is a seven. seven. Thank you. My handwriting is uh, a okay. little shaky. Okay. So if we look at this, then it's more advantageous to stay for the father. Than it is to leave. But not by that much. But not by that much. Right. So, if, let's say, P1 were to become lower, uh -huh. this would drop. Uh -huh. Or if his mating chance were lower, this uh -huh. would drop. Right. But in this case, we were able to create a situation where the male has a better chance uh -huh. of finding another female, uh -huh. but, it's <laughs> but it's actually disadvantageous for him to leave. Right. Right. So we've seen we're able to see that by working with these values, we can start to figure out that it's not as clear as simply observing a behavior and thinking, oh, if he's leaving, then he must have it better. We don't understand why. Right. You, you need to do the math. We need calculate to calculate the, the payoffs in that matrix. Exactly. Right. And the only way that we can figure out the math uh -huh. is by creating that matrix. Right. Because we have to go situation by situation, yeah. looking at each person's payout yeah. from a decision. Yeah. And, and as, as someone who, uh, as a statistician and a mathematician, I think this would all be a lot easier if you can tabulate a, a set of values in, in a mathematical programming language yep. and, and then um, calculate a function of these six parameters and, and, and then uh, plotting the results uh, somehow so that you can uh, visualize the, the, the uh, Vi vi visualize the the, the payoffs um, yeah. in, uh, in in a graph somehow, and I I, I haven't thought this out, uh, but but I, I think generally speaking, you you can there you, is a way to there, there is a, there is a way to graph this and and make the visualization easier. Yeah, um, where you can look at right. each individual point. Right, and this is actually what we do in okay. the field. We can do theoretical where we can create these numbers ourselves, uh -huh. or when we go into the field, we can spend 
months to years looking at how many offspring a nest can have, uh, how many offspring a female will have if she stays or if she destroys, right, right. what the probability yeah. of survival is, yeah. what the probability of a male finding another. So there's right. all of this very time consuming, yeah. very rigorous research that we do in the field, yeah. watching and observing. Yeah. With the caveat that, that those would be observational data yep. and, and therefore um, you you can't be sure that these are the only things that are affecting the, the exact outcomes of the, the sur survival of those offspring. Yeah. So right. when we work in the field, there are so many different things that can influence. There are environmental factors that we either can't control or right. may not know is there. Right. And that's where once you get into probability, uh, your p-values when yeah. doing your stats to determine if it's likely, yeah. that's why we work with a 0 0.95 confidence interval, 95 mm. confidence interval, because there's things that we can't account for. I, okay. I don't know about uh, your field of organic chemistry uh -huh. that you worked in, but I know for some of my uh, friends who are um, in physics, uh -huh. a lot of their work is with a 99 confidence interval. Wow. Well, that's well, another discussion. I mean, that's another that's discussion. In this, another discussion. I mean, there, yeah. there are we all kinds of that. yeah, right, right. There, there are all kinds of issues with with <laughs> p values that uh, can, deciding what is well, a good p. well, but but also there intrinsically there are issues with p values yes. and stuff. And I, I should also mention what 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 Mitchell is saying is a p value right now is different from these p's, p right? Yes. Okay. So these p's that he's talking about here, these are the probabilities of survival depending on the number of parents, okay? Yeah. What, he's, what he just talked about, the p-values, those are the, the, prob it's, it's, uh, the rigorous definition in statistics is the probability of a test statistic being at least as extreme as the observed value, assuming that the null hypothesis is true, okay? Yes. This, this episode of the central equilibrium is Doesn't. not about the p-value. We're not gonna get into that discussion. Um, but beyond just trying to deconstruct that that very verbose definition that I just said yeah. to you, there are, there are all kinds of problems and issues with p-values that we will just not get into in this yeah. episode. That, okay. that was a very eloquent <laughs> definition of it, by the way, that I would have never been able to come well, as close I'm, to you. I'm a statistician with a master's degree <laughs> in statistics, and I better be able to recite that definition precisely. <laughs> very true. Okay. So I, I think that I think the, the moral of the story is, though, that once, um, uh, uh, once you break break down a, a conflict in animal behavior into game theory, you can better understand the costs and benefits of your decisions by calculating the payoffs and by also just manipulating the different parameters in your environment. And, and understanding the environmental influences. Right, right. So what we just did here was very abstract. We were just saying this value changes, this value changes. Right. If we want to give a more real life example, uh -huh. what we can do for males, let's look at this exact situation. Uh -huh. We're not gonna concern ourselves with mating probability. Uh -huh. We'll simply look at survival rates. Okay. So what I'll do, if you don't mind, I'm gonna create another time okay. graph. So we will look at a situation where determining where we will determine whether it is advantageous to leave the nest. And we can say this for either the male or the female. Okay. So we have our time on our x-axis mm -hmm. and we have our proportion of the population mm -hmm. that, sh that displays this trait. Okay. So we have again Proportion of population. Uh, but now it's leave or stay as the two as possible the, behaviors. As the two behaviors. Okay. So what we'll do is we will create a, a fictional scenario. Mm -hmm. Let's say there is a species, a population of birds. Uh -huh. And there is a very, very aggressive predator that is in its area. And what that means is you need both parents there to defend from this predator. So, given this scenario, it's more advantageous to stay because you need two parents to protect. And what we see in the population is 
staying is the dominant behavior. Mm -hmm. Leaving is very low. But let's say it, something happens to that predator. Mm -hmm. Hunting or a sudden extinction or they decide to migrate to a new area. Mm -hmm. The threat of predators now of this highly aggressive predator now gone makes that P1 and P2 value more similar mm -hmm. because you don't need two parents constantly guarding because mm -hmm. there's a lower threat. Mm -hmm. So by making the P values more, the P1 and P2 values, the survival probabilities, the survival probabilities of the offspring more similar, as we saw with our examples, it starts to become more advantageous to leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And staying actually goes to the detriment. Mm -hmm. To mm -hmm. the point where if that predator population drops so low that P the P1 and P2 are very similar. Mm -hmm. Same to same as the situation, the first case for mm -hmm. both males and females, mm -hmm. we can see this happen. Mm -hmm. And now leaving mm -hmm. and not being monogamous, being polygamous, mm -hmm. being polyamorous. Yeah is now the dominant behavior. It's better uh -huh. to go to leave and find more mates. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And this is a situation that could be for either males or females. Ah, okay. Another situation that we can look at is again where leaving will flip this. We'll make a situation where it is better to leave uh -huh. than it is to stay. And we're gonna look at it from a male perspective. Okay. So, Leave is our dominant trait at the start. Stay is not. Okay. So I'll paint the picture for why this is. Okay. So we have, again, another species of bird. Uh -huh. Within this species, it is easy for males to get a new mate because it does not take a lot of time. It does not take a lot of resources. Uh -huh. So for some birds, they have these extravagant mating displays uh -huh. where they do a beautiful dance or they build something. Uh -huh. Let's say in this situation, that's not present. The male can simply leave one female, go and find another female. Uh -huh. Very high M value, probability uh -huh. of finding a new mate. Uh -huh. But let's say as time progresses, due to sexual selection or some other evolutionary pressure, uh -huh. Females decide that females start to become more choosy. Females start to become more selective of who they mate with. Meaning males, so we'll start down here, time progresses. And as this decision, as females become more choosy, males need to start investing more into winning a female. Uh -huh. Whether that is gathering resources, spending the time to gather resources uh -huh. or the energy to make bright colored feathers or build something beautiful uh -huh. as a mating display. Uh -huh. Leaving starts to become disadvantageous because it takes so much time and effort to get another female uh -huh. that that M value plummets. Okay. So we'll see as females become more and more choosy, the male may decide to leave. Uh -huh. Uh, may may not, decide to stay. May, may decide, decide to, to stay. stay. And it becomes better for the male to stay uh -huh. because the probability of finding a new female uh -huh. is so low uh -huh. because the time and effort required to get another female uh -huh. isn't possible. So at the beginning when when um when the, very few males are are leaving. If you're the first to leave and start looking for a second mate, you don't have anybody to compete with. So your probability of finding a new mate is pretty high. It it what, can be. Okay. So what what we're looking at here is we're looking at the that M value, that probability yeah. is not just the likelihood of finding another female uh -huh. that is willing, uh -huh. but being able to prove that oh. he is worthy okay. of having kids. And, and in this scenario, why is M decreasing over time? Because let's go back to that population of birds. Yeah. Let's say at the very beginning, when uh -huh. females aren't as choosy, a male can simply show up, uh -huh. sing a very quick, beautiful song that uh -huh. takes 
10 seconds, 15 seconds, uh -huh. and, have, and have a chance of mating with her. Uh -huh. The M is fairly high yeah. because there's not much cost into making this yeah. and there's not a lot of differentiation. He just sings the song. Okay. But if the female decides to be choosy, starts looking for higher quality mates, then the then males have to differentiate themselves. So you're saying that so over time the the factor that's changing is the choosiness of the female. Is the choosiness of the females, oh, okay. which causes the male probability of mating okay. to decrease because okay. females are more choosy. Okay. They're not going. They're going to be more strict about who they mate with. Okay. And not only will it be harder for males to just mate, uh -huh. it's possible that. They have to build something now, or they have okay. to maintain very bright feathers, okay. which adds costs of energy and time. Okay. So instead of yeah. a quick 10 second song, it may take three days oh, to build okay. your structure. Okay. And it still may not be good enough. Ah, okay. So now you have the issue of you're putting in so much time and energy and still having a low chance uh -huh. that leaving and finding another mate uh -huh. just isn't feasible. Okay, now in in the animal world, mm -hmm. why would the choosiness of a female change over time? There, there are a large number of factors um, that we won't get into because okay. it's it's due to five five main influencers on evolution, okay. namely sexual selection, okay. and a lot of other complicated things. Okay. But okay. but what but what we understand is that. Females consistently are investing more into having offspring than males. It costs more yeah. energy on them. Yeah. So females have the ability to start being more and more selective uh -huh. because they're the limiting factor. Yeah. Males can theoretically have as many offspring as they can theoretically have infinite offspring. They can, if there are infinite females, yeah. infinite offspring. Uh -huh. But a female is restricted to a set number of offspring she can have in her lifespan. Uh -huh. It's not possible in a single lifespan to have infinite children. Uh -huh. So due to this limitation and the added costs, the excess costs on a female to gestate and birth, uh -huh. there is a benefit to her to be more selective of her Oh, okay, okay, okay. And that and that would get into a whole another topic okay, of sexual okay, selection. Okay, but but just just as just taking this assumption as given that mm -hmm. that females are becoming becoming more selective over time. Yep. Uh, it it becomes advantageous for males to leave. Uh, to, uh, to, to, sorry, stay. to stay to stay yeah. and 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 take care of the children because uh, the probability of of finding another female is is lower and it also just takes more uh, it takes more energy to yep. to prove um, that the the male is desirable yes. and and that that the female should choose him yes okay precisely okay okay i i think it's interesting how uh, if either parent decides to leave, um, there's there's no guarantee that their second set of offspring will have will be the same number as the original set. Yep. But but for different reasons, right? Yes. For for mothers, it's it's we're assuming that the ex we're assuming that it is less because uh, it 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 costs energy to gestate and give birth to new offspring. Yes. Um, there's more of an investment. Right. So, uh, right. Whereas for, for males, there's no cost to having children yep. for, for a male. Very, very, very small. Yeah. Ass assume, assume to be negligible. Yeah. But the probability of finding a mate uh, is not 100%. It exactly. It's not one. Um, conversely, for, for females... Uh, at least in the animal kingdom, generally speaking, we're assuming that females are guaranteed to be able to find a partner, yes. a new sexual partner. It, it's a general assumption it's that gen may not always be accurate, but it's what we work with in this right. situation. Okay, that, that 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 they can always find a partner, a new partner, if they 
uh, abandoned their, their, their original children. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, that's very interesting. But but I think that the larger message is that given um, given a payoff matrix and given the the the, the possible behaviors that the participants can have and and given a set of environmental conditions that define the parameters of, of those behaviors, we can have a rigorous understanding of the the possible outcomes and also how those outcomes translate into population dynamics just as you've drawn in the last two graphs. Yes, it, precisely. We, yeah. we get to see how and predict how behaviors will change in uh -huh. a population. Uh -huh. And it also helps us, as with the cooperation, the first payoff matrix we did, yeah. understand why a behavior that we originally didn't understand why it still existed. Uh -huh. We thought it was so subpar. Right. We can now, through math, yeah. show that actually it's a beneficial situation right. given a set of circumstances. Right. And it gives us also, in our past two examples, an understanding of well, why has a behavior changed in a population? Right. What, what could have caused this? Right. We can now look at it and go, okay, we can apply math to it. We can apply costs and a payoff matrix uh -huh. and say empirically with uh -huh. numbers, this is why over time, uh -huh. because this factor, which is variable P1, whichever, uh -huh. has changed, uh -huh. we can now show when it becomes better yeah. to change. Yeah, yeah. That's that's very, very helpful, very elucidating, makes what, what seems like a, a, a myriad of, of options and outcomes a lot more organizable and understandable. Yeah, right. okay. and, and this is why it is one of my favorite areas in behavioral ecology, uh -huh. because you get to take these things that we don't really understand from just observing and looking at, yeah. and we can start to understand them and predict them mm. through through math yeah. and through a payoff matrix. Yeah. And the versatility of evolutionary game theory and these payoff matrices matrices yeah. are massive. Yeah. And my personal favorite is the creativity, uh -huh. because, for example, with the abandoning uh -huh. equations. You, you can figure out what the behaviors are, uh -huh. but you have to sit there and understand it well enough uh -huh. to put it in a numerical uh, framework. Framework. Yeah, yeah. And it's a fun problem solving yeah, challenge. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, I, I think, I think the, the, the last thing that I've taken away from this is that um, you, the... the it, 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 even though at first I didn't quite see why um, game theory would would be applicable to a, ecology as I've learned it in, 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 in economics, now that you've explained it all and, and shown some examples, it actually seems quite understandable and if not obvious why game theory would, would make sense. Not only to understand um, conflicts between two participants but also at a at a population level and that that's exactly how game theory is used in economics as yeah. well okay it, it's surprisingly similar yeah yeah okay so this has been very educational very informative and and very interesting to me thank you mitchell for yeah. for talking about this topic with me today i'm more than happy to it's a favorite topic of mine i'm just i'm very glad and uh, honored that you'd have me on your show okay but before we uh, finish the episode, a question that I ask all my guests is, is there a book or a website or a blog or a video or an essay that you've encountered recently in math, science, or economics that you found to be really interesting you'd like to share with our audience? Um, the book that comes to mind for me is a book called Are We Smart Enough to Know How Smart Animals Are? Uh -huh. by Franz Duval. Uh -huh. And it is a history looking at animal behavior and how the field has grown and developed, yeah. um, the directions that it's continuing to go, yeah. but also the challenges that the scientific field has faced. Uh -huh. The growing pains, the conflict, the people coming out and taking a theory and saying, no, that doesn't work. Uh -huh. And it looks at animal intelligence, 
potential consciousness in right. animals and also raises the question as the title says are we smart enough and are we able to think in a way where we can where we can determine just how smart something is mm-hmm, mm-hmm. whether it's relative to us or whether it's smart compared to its environment uh-huh. to to take a famous quote from darwin take a fish and ask it to climb a tree uh-huh. it's it would be deemed stupid. It uh-huh. would be deemed not fit. Uh-huh. But in water, it's incredibly fit. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So we have. So it's a good look at understanding how can we understand animal intelligence. Uh-huh. Okay, and I'll make sure to put the name of that book and the name of the author in the show notes, which is in the description of this video down below. Uh, My name is Eric Kai. I am the chemical statistician. If you'd like to learn more about statistics or chemistry or tips about career development, you can, of course, visit my blog, The Chemical Statistician. Uh, If you'd like to learn more about statistics or chemistry chemistry through my video tutorials, you can visit my YouTube channel, which, of course, is also down below in the uh, description of this video. Uh, If you'd like to watch more episodes of The Central Equilibrium, please visit uh, the the webpage of this channel, uh, which, of course, I will also include in the description of of this video. Uh, And you can, of course, follow me on Twitter at ChemStatEric. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope that you learned something useful today. Thank you. Take care.